Hello? Can you hear me? Is anybody out there? Okay, good. <laughs> good morning, good morning. Uh, we've had a good morning so far, haven't we? Thanks, Jason. Jason's enjoyed himself. Very good. Well, listen, for those who don't know me, my name is Paul, Paul Metherall. I'm married to Lottie, two kids, George and Safi. We live in Cheltenham. We're in the process of uh, planting a church. Uh, we'd love some of you to join us, as John said earlier, but we don't, all, we don't want all of you to join us on the same day, okay? Are you with me? Uh, we don't want sort of, you know, 95 coming on, the, on one Sunday, and then, you know, we never see you, any of you again. So we're asking you to sign up just so that, you know, we can sort of uh, feel like the support's there, but we have regular support. So hopefully that's helpful. Good. Well, this morning, uh, I just wanted to uh, share something with us on the theme of following the cloud and why will become obvious as we go through if you haven't uh, worked it out already. And I just wanted to share something from Exodus 13 and 14. Now, if you're not familiar with the story of Exodus, it's, a, it's an epic struggle. It's the sort of thing that Charlton Heston would sort of make films about and star in. And... Uh, to catch you up, if you're not sure, uh, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, their descendants ended up in Egypt. Egypt was the military power of the day, and uh, they ended up in slavery in Egypt. And at the, right at the beginning of Exodus, they cry out to God, and they say, come and help us, come and deliver us. And God raises up Moses, a leader to deliver them. And then this sort of grand battle ensues where Pharaoh doesn't want to let his workforce go. And, you know, Moses is insistent that they've got to go. And we get all the plagues. And there's this sort of battle about who is more powerful. Is it Pharaoh or is it Yahweh, God? And ultimately, Yahweh proves to be more powerful. And so he leads his people out of Egypt and he leads them through a, a long period of 40 years and ultimately leads them into the promised land. And it's a beautiful picture of uh, God's deliverance of one nation, but it also speaks more broadly of God's deliverance that he wants to bring to people from every nation. And the church has long understood the book of Exodus as providing a picture of what Jesus has done for us. It sort of points forwards to Jesus. Uh, one commentator writes this. He said, Jesus' sacrificial death brought about a new Exodus, liberating God's people from slavery to sin and subjection to death ending their exile from God, gathering them and all peoples and leading them into the promised land of, heavenly, of the heavenly kingdom and of the new Jerusalem. So it's a picture, if you like, of the spiritual life. And just, if you've got a Bible, we're going to just turn to Exodus 13. Part of this is going to come up on the screen because uh, I realized uh, just now as I was looking over my notes, I'd forgotten a bit. Uh, so if you've got a Bible, we'll turn to Exodus 13. And then when we reach Exodus 14, that'll come up too. Okay, great. So I'm going to start at verse 20. After leaving Succoth, they camped to Ephem on the edge of the desert. Exodus 13, verse 21. By day, the Lord went ahead of them in a pillar of cloud to guide them and on their way. And by night, in a pillar of fire to give them light. So they could travel by day or by night. Neither the pillar of cloud by day nor the pillar of cloud by night left its place in front of the people. Then the Lord said to Moses, tell the Israelites to turn back and encamp near pi Haroth, near between Migdol and the sea. They are to encamp by the sea directly opposite Baal Zephon. Pharaoh will think, 
The Israelites are wandering around the land in confusion, hemmed in by the desert. And I will harden Pharaoh's heart, and he will pursue them. But I will gain glory for myself through Pharaoh and his army, and the Egyptians will know that I am God. So the Israelites did this. When the king of Egypt was told that the people had fled, Pharaoh and his officials changed their mind about them and said, what have we done? We've let the Israelites go and have lost their services. So he had his chariots made ready and took his army with him. He took 600 of the best chariots along with all the other chariots of Egypt, with officers over all of them. The Lord hardened the heart of Pharaoh, king of Egypt, so he pursued the Israelites who were marching out boldly. The Egyptians, all Pharaoh's horses and chariots, horsemen and troops, pursued the Israelites and overtook them as they encamped by the sea near Parheheroth, opposite Baal Zephon. As Pharaoh approached, the Israelites looked up and there were the Egyptians marching after them. They were terrified and cried out to the Lord. They said to Moses, was it because there were no graves in Egypt that you brought us out to the desert to die? What have you done to us by bringing us out of Egypt? Didn't we say to you in Egypt, leave us alone. Let us serve the Egyptians. It would have been better for us to serve the Egyptians than to die in the desert. Moses answered the people, do not be afraid. Stand firm and you will see the deliverance the Lord will bring you today. The Egyptians you see today, you will never see again. The Lord will fight for you. You only need to be still. So here we've got the start of their journey out of slavery in Egypt. And verse 13 talks about a pillar of fire and a pillar of cloud leading them. And uh, I wanted to just ask for it to imagine for a moment what that must be like. If you imagine we're the people of Israel, we're sort of, you know, we're being led out. What it must be like to be led by a pillar of cloud by day and a pillar of fire by night. I think we even have a picture. There you go. This is what it was like. Moses' cell phone, I think. Um, what it was like. Off again. You know, we only arrived yesterday. Better pack up. Oh, we've got to go again. Little Ezekiel wet his bed last night. Now, how am I going to get the washing dry if we have to pack up and move? You know, it's so exciting. Where are we going to go? Probably a whole variety of different reactions to uh, uh, what it means as God leads his people. And I want to use this story, the idea of following the cloud, as we consider how God is leading us in this, uh, in this coming season and just draw out two or three lessons for us. Who, uh, probably uh, most of us will be aware of a review that happened within our Salt and Light family. Can you wave at me if you know what I'm talking about? If you're not, that's fine. Okay, great. So some of us do, some of us don't. That's helpful to know. Earlier in the year, uh, for those of us, uh, sorry, uh, for those of us who don't know, our family of churches is part of the Salt and Light Advance family, and we invited a review team in to come and help us uh, look at what the way forward was together. And we have a habit in our family of churches from time to time of uh, inviting these reviews, inviting trusted friends to help us find the way forward. That could be times of trouble, times of success, times of transition. And I think we felt as a, uh, the leadership team of Salt and Light Advance that uh, Steve Jones, uh, who has been leading our family of churches, uh, felt God calling him to focus on uh, the church that he leads in Oxford. Neil Townsend, who leads Open Gate, uh, it's felt God sort of opening up sort of wider vistas for him in other parts of the world, in Europe and in America. And we've had a number of uh, leaders sort of moving in uh, sovereignly. Rich and Anna Elwood, who many of us will know if you're part of the church here in Whitney. God just telling them to move here, but without telling them why. 
And just in light of that, we asked the team to come in and help us to uh, look at what the future might hold. And they came back with three recommendations. Now, um, uh, there is a blog post on the Salt and Light website, which uh, probably most of us have received an email pointing us to. And that came back with three recommendations. Uh, which I just wanted to share with us briefly by way of uh, helping us as we then start to think about what this next season is like. And their recommendations were that we should have a single apostolic team working across the 19 churches in Salt and Light Advance. Previously, we've had three teams and that we moved to one team. They also recommended a change of leadership. Uh, We knew that was coming because uh, Stephen Bev uh, felt like this sort of coming season, they should stand down from leading that group. And they recommended that Rich and Anna Elwood, here we go, here's their face, there we go. If you're not sure what they look like, that's not them. Okay. (laughs) There is a picture of them that they should lead uh, our family of churches. And we love Rich and Anna, here we go. There we go, there we go. What a good-looking couple, eh? Uh, Rich and Anne, that they should uh, lead our family of churches and that there should be a new unity and working together. I just wanted to say something about uh, Rich and Anna. We've known Rich for uh, at least 20 years uh, and Anna for uh, probably the time they'd be married, something about that. And in the last 12 months, as as Rich was coming over, uh, Rich and Anna were... Uh, feeling God was speaking to them about coming over. We spent some time talking with them and uh, they felt like they should be moving to West Oxfordshire. And I I remember one evening just driving over to Whitney for something and having a phone conversation with Rich and saying uh, he wasn't at that point, didn't really know what sort of, what job he was coming to, didn't have any joy from the uh, job applications that he'd done. And I said, well, we have got this regional administrator role it's well beneath your abilities but you know hey you know if all else fails (laughs) you could do that and uh, to cut a long story short he ended up doing that and I suppose I just wanted to say that to us I mean Rich has served enormously well in that role Friday by Friday he's making the teas and coffees Uh, he's organizing things he Uh, has a real heart to serve. Uh, They both do, in fact. Uh, And I suppose I just wanted to commend them to you and to say, actually, you know, we've known them over many years. Uh, As they come to lead our family of churches, our wider family of churches, I think they're enormously well-placed. That guy's got a real heart to serve. They're diligent. Rich is very diplomatic. They're people of faith, Ah, people who give themselves to the Lord and to the church. And I couldn't commend them to you highly enough. Uh, We were asked at a certain point, would we serve under them? And we gave a resounding yes, (laughs) as all of our uh, leaders have done, I have to say. And then there's a new unity and working together. And this does affect us. As you know, we've developed a Uh, an identity of roots and rivers uh, out of a sense of wanting to be deeply rooted in God's word and to follow the Holy Spirit wherever he leads. And uh, it's a pity Derek West isn't here this morning. Um, Derek West, I always think, is the best dressed man in West Oxfordshire. He's always wearing a sort of, uh, you know, a waistcoat and then he's wearing a jacket on top. And if Derek West were here this morning, I'd get him to come out to explain to us this little picture of what's going on. Derek's got the jacket on, and as he, uh, uh, and he's he's wearing the sort of the waistcoat, and the waistcoat is a little bit like Roots and Rivers. We're being asked as part of this review to, to take the jacket off, to take off Roots and Rivers, and to fully inhabit and fully embrace the jacket that is Salt and Light. Does that make some sense? Some of, you are, some of you are nodding at me. Good. I thought it might help some of us. So we're being asked to lay down our identity as roots and rivers and to 
fully inhabit what we already are. I guess that's what I'm trying to communicate to us. Salt and light is not something that's sort of distant and new. We're simply embracing what we already are. Okay, I think I need you to nod at me if that makes sense and shake your head if it doesn't. Okay, Jeff's laughing, so who knows what that means. Uh, But there we go. Anyway, so it means some changes for us. It means that we probably won't meet again in this format, but we will be meeting together with the other churches in Salt and Light Advance on the 5th of November. So it's a bit of a series, a bit of a, a, a season of transition. We still believe in the same things. We still believe uh, God wants flourishing churches that are connected together, that work together, uh, that are family together, that enjoy relational life together, that enjoy the presence and work of the Spirit, that are served by apostolic ministry, that uh, work together for kingdom purpose. All of those things haven't changed. We've just lost the waistcoat, if I can put it that way. You know, it's simpler. We've lost the layer, uh, if I can put it that way. So that's something of what's going on. And I guess in that context, I was sort of praying and thinking, what would serve us as we go forward? Uh, This particular passage came to mind because it speaks about following where the Holy Spirit leads. Speaks about following God where he leads. And we do feel uh, as leaders across the whole family of churches that this is that the recommendations from the review were where God was leading us. And there was a resounding yes. And as we go forward, I just wanted to offer in just the few minutes we've got left, a few reflections on this story to help us both corporately, but I trust it helps you in your local churches and individually in your lives, how we can follow God together. Who loves C.S. Lewis? Yeah, C.S. Lewis, okay. When I was a kid, I remember working my way through the Narnia series, reading it. Probably some of us will have read, uh, read the book, some of us will watch the film. Anybody remember the TV series? You know, yeah, Children of the 80s or, or whatever it was. Um, and it's a wonderful story. And in the story, Aslan sacrifices himself for the traitor Edmund who's deserving of death, and he goes willingly to the stone table. And then there's this sort of amazing moment where the stone table gets broken in two, and Aslan is back again. He hasn't died. He's alive. And I vividly remember as a child my dad explaining something to me about this book, which you probably all know, um, that The Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe is an allegory, a sort of picture of Jesus' work on the cross. We're each deserving of death. God himself, the lion, willingly sacrifices himself for us. But that's not the end. The resurrection happens. And it's a vivid picture of one of the pictures that the New Testament gives of what Jesus achieved on the cross, substitutionary atonement for those who were theologically, like the theological term for it. And suddenly my eyes were open to a greater reality. I thought, oh, yes. You know, it's like one of those moments where suddenly it's sort of like the penny drops. Oh, that's what's going on. Something bigger is at play. And that's often the way that things work with God. I don't know if you've worked that out. Uh, Oh, I don't know. Probably about six or seven years ago when we were leading the church in Chipping Norton. uh, I remember sitting around a table one evening with uh, one of the missional communities Uh, around Graham and Bev's, uh, uh, Graham and Bev Lane's table. And uh, we had a very nice meal together. And they said, we feel like God's speaking to us about gathering people around our table. Like, oh, that sounds like a good thing, you know, having lost people in, gathering them around your table. That sounds like it might be God. Brilliant. On you, you know, we encourage them. On you go. Uh, If we fast forward about five or six years Actually, what they're doing is they're not gathering lots of people around their table. They're gathering people around a very big table or a number of tables in the town hall in Chipping Norton. It's called Community Suppers, and you've got 40 people coming along week, uh, month by month. Month by month. Give us an update then. A lot more than that. A lot more than that. (laughs) 
70 people, there you go. So they thought God was calling them to a small table with a few people gathering around. But actually what God had in mind was something bigger and better and bolder. He had 70 people in mind gathering around a table. Often when God speaks to us, he's got something bigger in mind. Over the last few years, the last couple of years really, we've heard the same sort of, uh, as people give us prophetic words from week to week, as, as leaders we're praying, as we gather in settings like this, God often speaks to us. And there have been two themes that have come out again and again. The first is the presence of the Holy Spirit. And the second is a working together more closely. So we've got a picture coming up. Here we go. It's of a tapestry, if that helps. I can't get the thing to work, Steve. Oh, no, there it is. Right, there we go. There's a tapestry. That's good, isn't it? We've had, we've had this picture two or three times uh, from Sarah Bailey, a picture of an industrial weaving loom, a few threads being woven together, and God adding in more colored threads, making a multicolored fabric. Kathy, Kathy Young, who's here somewhere, a weaving loom, shuttle going back and forth, something being, uh, being brought into being. C had a similar sort of picture. It's a picture of uh, God wanting us to work and cooperate together more. Anna Elwood, just before she moved, shared a picture with us of uh, well, a sort of well-worn pathway Okay, a well-worn pathway. And God's saying, between your churches, there are lots of well, well-worn pathways, but God wants to widen them. I could see the paths, she wrote, starting to widen and widen and get much bigger. The paths were no longer footpaths, but more like wide roads. I could see stones being added to the width of the path, one by one. God is going to widen the paths, between all of the churches, the strong connections and relationships that are being created are long-lasting. Now, he wants to build larger roads between the churches. He wants to increase accessibility and increase interaction. And I guess I just wanted to say to us, out of those themes, I think as we considered them, we felt like God is speaking to us. And we felt like it was for the Roots and Rivers family of churches. But I think as we started to come, to the review and read the recommendations and prayed and talked together, it seemed pretty obvious that God was speaking about something bigger. He wasn't simply talking about closer connections and a weaving together of five or six churches, but actually right across our churches. Uh, he bringing us together more, uh, more firmly. So, God's guided us, I think, along this way. He's already been speaking about us, <laughs> widening pathways, about being woven together. It feels like uh, what God spoke about has a new meaning, a new resonance now that perhaps we wouldn't have, uh, wouldn't have spotted before. And for the Israelites, as they go through uh, the sort of 40 years, Nehemiah, looking back on these events, says these words. Uh, I'm getting some login thing coming up, Steve, so I can't control it. Thank you. Nehemiah says these words, Nehemiah 9, 19. Because of your great compassion, you did not abandon them, this is the Israelites, in the desert. By day, the pillar of cloud did not cease to guide them or take them on their path, nor the pillar of fire by night to shine them on the way they were going to take. At each point, God leads and guides his people. He's been leading and guiding us. If you know God here today, God wants to guide you. He wants to lead you. We don't have a pillar of fire or a pillar of cloud that we follow, but we do have the Holy Spirit. We do have the community of faith that he puts us in, in order to help us. Uh, and he wants to guide us and lead us. And God, John was praying earlier, uh, because God is good, not just in what he does, but in who he is, everything that flows from him is good, and so he can't possibly lead us into anything that is not good in every single way. And so we can trust God to guide us. 
In the passage that we just read in Exodus 14, uh, I want us to see something here. 14, 1 and 2 says this. Then the Lord said to Moses, tell the Israelites to turn back and encamp. So they're still in Egypt at this point, near Pi Haharoth, between Migdol and the sea. They are to encamp by the sea. So God here leads his people into a dead end. If your geography of Egypt's not very good, like mine isn't, I had to look it up. Okay, he leads them into a dead end. And worse than that, it actually says that when they're in that dead end, they end up being surrounded because the chariots come round them and are on the other side. Isn't that extraordinary? God leads his people into a dead end. They're still in Egypt. They're stuck. They're in a cul-de-sac. There's no way out. Uh, And if that wasn't bad enough, they're also surrounded by the greatest military power of the day. And that has an effect That has an effect on them. It says in verse 8 that they marched out boldly. And then the Israelites, sorry, the Egyptians turn up. And what happens? Well, they start moaning. (laughs) You know, were there no graves in Egypt? I mean, it would have been better to have been buried in comfort than to be, you know, slaughtered out here in the wilderness. (laughs) But actually, God uses the dead end as an opportunity for his people to trust him, to show his deliverance and to work out his purposes. And maybe you felt like, maybe you feel like you're in a dead end at the moment, who knows? Uh, Maybe you feel like uh, God's led you into dead ends. Actually, God uses the dead ends of life to build our faith, to grow our confidence and trust in him, and uh, provide us with opportunities to trust him. And that's part of the spiritual life, dead ends and deliverance. So the first, in case you weren't spotting, the first point was guidance. God guides us, guides us by his spirit. Secondly, God uses the dead ends of life to uh, help us trust him. And the third thing is the, the, the long way round. I was about to say the wrong way round. Um, As God leads us, I don't know about you, but I quite like shortcuts. I mean, I don't go out of my house in the morning. I think I need to go somewhere. Let me just take the longest possible way to get there. I mean, I quite like to think, you know, what's what's the quickest way to get there? And, um, you know, if there's a queue of traffic, like, is there a sort of, you know, is there another way I could get around it? Uh, Anybody like to get things for cheap, cheaper? Yeah, anybody like cheap? Yeah, some of us like cheap. Okay, you know, it's just nice to get a discount on something, isn't it? You know, you find something over here and you think, oh, it's, you know, it's 20 quid cheaper over there. Isn't that brilliant? Well, it's interesting. In Exodus 13, uh, we see God took the Israelites the long way round. Exodus 13, 17 and 18 says this. When Pharaoh let the people go, God did not lead them on the road through the Philistine country, though it was shorter. For God said, if they face war, they might change their minds and return to Egypt. So God led the people around by the desert roads towards the Red Sea. The Israelites went up out of Egypt armed for battle. Isn't that interesting? God takes them the long way around because of his mercy. I remember at the age of 19, I felt God speak to me about leading churches and I thought, I better go to Bible college, because um, that's what you do, isn't it? Um, and year by year, God never let me go. And sort of like each September, I think, oh, is this the year when I should go? Um, and it never, I never felt God sort of, you know, a release from God to go, if I could put it that way. And for almost nine years, every prophetic word I had uh, was all about a time of preparation. Uh, I can see some people out there who even prophesied that over me. Um, It's a time of preparation. Finally, one day, I was driving home from Manchester, and I was listening to a talk which Steve Thomas was giving, encouraging leaders to sort of like let their people go to Bible college. Like, you know, you know. Don't worry about holding on to them, you know, just send them off. And suddenly I thought, oh, yeah, I could go to Bible college. And suddenly there was uh, sort of guidance from God or a sort of release from God or something. It's like, yes, this is the moment. And so I 
you know, got home, had a chat with Lottie, and something similar had happened to her that day at work. Uh, so I went and had a chat with Dan and said, I think we should go to Bible college. Um, I don't know what God saved us from. <laughs> but we were led the wrong way round, the long way round. And maybe you feel like you're being led the wrong way round. Can't say it, can I? What am I trying to say? Maybe you feel like, it's not easy to say, maybe you feel like you're being led the long way round. But God in his wisdom sometimes does that to us. Liam Thatcher, who many of us will know, part of our family of churches in Oxford, says this. What if what feels like the slowness of God is actually his mercy? What if what feels like an unnecessarily long route is actually him protecting us from battles we aren't yet ready to fight? God sometimes takes us the long way around. Sometimes he leads us into dead ends. Sometimes he guides us in ways we don't understand. Maybe for some of us, we feel like the things that God's spoken to us about just seem a very long way off. But as we follow God together, and we're not supposed to do it on our own, we're supposed to do it in community. Uh, as we follow God, he will guide us. He can be trusted. If he leads us into a dead end, it's only so he, will, he can show, uh, he, can, he can build our trust in him and show us a way through. If he leads us the long way round, who knows what he might be saving us from? We can trust God. And we're at this point as a family of churches where we're entering into something new. It's a, a time of transition. Uh, but we can trust God. Whatever's going on in your life, whatever's going on in your church life, together we need to be following the cloud, following the Holy Spirit. It's not a license to do what we like. We need to, uh, need to measure what God's, uh, what God's asking us to do against his word we need to talk to others about it. There's wisdom in wise counsel. That's why God puts us in church family so that there are people alongside us to help us. But God wants to lead us. God is leading us. God will lead you as we go forward. God bless you, John. Over to you.